This is Judge Joe Brown, and we're listening to We All Be News. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. Hello, Mr. Williams, are you there? Yes, sir. Go right ahead. Oh, yeah, I was uh, actually, first of all, I want to say it's an honor to talk to you, sir. You're Captain Jerry Williams of the uh, Tire of the uh, Memphis Police Department, right? The MPD? Yes, sir. That's correct. And so I was like, ask a couple questions concerning uh, April 4th, 1968, the assassination of Dr. King. I want to know yes, where were you located? Do uh, you remember where you was at? Yeah, I was at the home, my office at the homicide office at that time. I was a homicide investigator, and uh, I uh, early that morning when I re- when I reported to work around eight o'clock, I was told by my uh, inspector that uh, I wouldn't be have to work uh, that day. I mean, on, on security. So I felt then that something was wrong. You know, it was unusual. And uh, because for the past several times that Dr. King would come to Memphis, the black uh, policemen, uh, uniform, I mean, uniform men and uh, playing clothesmen would be in the security for Dr. King. But on this particular incident, we would not. There was no black officers that was uh, assigned for his security. Who was responsible for organizing that uh, black officer unit that protected Dr. King, that security detail? Who was responsible for that? Well, my inspector, your late uh, inspector Don Smith was the inspector, and he was in charge of security at that time. And he would only get me. I would be I would be selected from the detective bureau. They would usually get men from the detective bureau for those assignments. And... Uh, uh, there were several policemen who were assigned from time to time uh, that Dr. King would come to Memphis. Was, but, was, uh, wait, I'm sorry. Well, on this particular uh, occasion, as I recall, uh, none of us was assigned to report to uh, on that particular day, the day that Dr. King was assassinated. There were no black officers. And to my memory that uh, had anything to do with Dr. King's security. I don't know why. I, down through the years, I felt that possibly some of our black uh, leaders supposed to have been leaders who were supposed to make sure that uh, that was what would have happened, but apparently they didn't. They would not have. See, during that time, uh, the end of ACP and the N- NCS. NSC uh, had a conflict. It's just like a gang war, a gang conflict, you know. Mm-hmm. NAACP was not as good as, work, as good a work as they did. They were working on one side. They were working on the judicial uh, side and uh, trying to get things done in their way, in which they did a good job. I'm not, uh, I'm not really uh, down on them about that. But then when Dr. King was coming to Memphis, I think they felt like that he was interfering with what they were trying to do. I mean, just put it in that, I would put it in that respect. So the uh, NAACP did not get involved until after Dr. King was assassinated. And then everybody came to front, Maxine and Jesse Turner, all of those people who were in the in the forefront of the civil rights movement was not uh in tune with what Dr. King was trying to do. Now that's my feeling about it and I would tell anybody that it just that to me it was just uh, I've seen because we did not they did not as, as police officers we were in a kind of particular situation because we were doing the doing the during that time, there were a lot of strikes in Memphis. Uh, there had been one or two riots and everything. And, of course, we were not in the front of that. It was the white officers who, who, who handled that. And it was the white officers who were supposed to have been in charge of Dr. King's assassination, not the black officers. So you said the white officers actually. You said there was conspiracy involved in white officers and the assassination of Dr. King. White Memphis Police Department officers. Yeah, it was what Memphis Police officers, but they were white officers. All right, it was like. Well, go ahead. I'm sorry. 
but uh, to my uh, to my knowledge, there were no black police officers. And there were I know that there were several white officers who were on the scene uh, at the time that Dr. King. Now I was at homicide, as I said. I was in my office, and I was told about five o'clock that afternoon that Dr. King had been assassinated. And I didn't believe it at first because. One of the officers they reported to me was a white officer, and I didn't have much confidence in what he was saying. But the next four or five minutes, the inspector came in, the inspector of the bureau. He came in and said Dr. King had been assassinated and that we got to get down to the scene. Well, you mean like, not 5 o'clock, but 6 o'clock, right? You were talking about it happened at 6 o'clock or did it happen at 5 o'clock? No, it was around 5 o'clock in the afternoon, to my knowledge. Okay. Because like, I was working mm-hmm. from 8 to 5 or 8 to 5.30. And it happened between that time. I know it was between right around the 5 o'clock hour. Because <laughs> shortly after that, within minutes, the Memphis Police Department was getting, <coughs> excuse me, mm-hmm. they were hauling the cops. The, the, uh, my inspector on the second thought said that two of us, there was two, it may have been three white officers, but it was two, two, two white officers, detectives, and myself, my inspector asked us to stay in the office to, to receive the calls. Mm-hmm. And we did. Within eight to ten minutes, there were calls coming in from all over, from, uh, from um, oh, man, I, from California mm-hmm. uh, and uh, coming in from New York and even coming in from England. And well, the press, the press was calling, or who was the people that were calling? <laughs> no, the, the press was calling. Okay information mm-hmm. and uh, we had to uh, have them to refer to uh, to the police director at that time and uh, the call so we 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 at that time we had not even gone to the scene yet because uh, uh, it took us a few minutes to collect the call that we had to get before we left going to the scene and when I got to the scene my partner and I, uh, well, I met one black officer who had reported to the scene, and we together got together. He and I, we were both uh, playing close detectives. I don't, I think he was working on homicide. I believe he was at that time. And his name was Elmo Berkeley, and he and I drove to the scene, from the scene to the hospital, the St. Joseph Hospital, and here on the north, just north of Memphis, north of the police department. And uh, we went in and we viewed Dr. King's body and we saw where he had been slaughtered and and everything. And I talked to the, I recall talking to the um, nurse or maybe the doctor, why had he been, his body had been sliced like that, you know, from this chest area and all was just laying over. And he said they were trying to me- massage his, his his heart, get his heart started. But that's about all I can remember offhand. And I said uh, that Dr. King, uh, but he was a wonderful man. He died a a death that was really it it, it was to help black people all over. All over the United States, not only black people, white people had, a lot of white people had, not, not, not the racist type, but a lot of white people had, had a feeling that Dr. King had done a wonderful job in his career as, uh, as he were trying to bring about some type of recognition and conciliation, not only between white folks and but black folks as well. And I think he did a, mar- a marvelous job. And the thing that bothers me, young man, is that uh, I see I have a young black man who do not realize what this man did to help us. Uh, we see our young black men are just going wild and going with the British swagging and all this. I think if Dr. King came today, he he would he would he would sound it. He would certainly be embarrassed to see this type of carrying on today. 
I, I really didn't get the chance to talk to you, but uh, I'm just telling you, and in, 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 in essence, what I know about it, and we're going back almost yeah, 40 sure. years now. Yeah. I, want to ask you, I want to ask you like some couple of things, key things. Um, was it unusual for a black person to be admitted to St. Joseph's Hospital? No, no, that was not. Uh, no. I, you know, that was that wasn't unusual. It hadn't been just before that that the hospital was segregated. But uh, I think that because my father was admit had been admitted to the hospital before that, so mm-hmm. there were black people who had been admitted there. But it hadn't been just too long uh, before that because civil rights did didn't come to to uh, the South in particular Memphis, as I recall, until. Uh, the um, the um, schools were desegregated, and then the uh, public facilities were desegregated, and uh, that happened just during the time that Dr. King was coming in and out of Memphis, because some of the places were still segregated. Do you remember the first time Dr. King came to Memphis, or the first time you worked the security uh, detail for Dr. King? Not about uh, three years before Dr. King came to Memphis and uh, his final uh, destination was he he came to my church. I'm a member of Metropolitan Baptist Church, and he spoke at that church at that particular time. That was my first time of hearing him. Uh, and about two years later, he came again. And the third time he came, uh, Abernathy came just as Dr. King had been assassinated. What were your thoughts about Dr. King as a person? I mean, the chance to see him. Did you talk to him? Oh. I had talked to him briefly. Uh, my situation, my situation, more or less, was to see that he was secured act, uh, uh, and in and an accurate way. We wanted to make sure that uh, when he when he was at the um, hospital, uh, hospital, not hospital, but the um, the hotel? Yeah, um, hotel, just correct. And I wanted to make sure I would have my men to go in and check the security. My security men would go in and check the bed, check everything, check the telephone and everything, make sure. And then I'd have one man posted. Every two hours I'd change up, we'd have two men uh, posted. And one of the things that I re- do remember, uh, at that time the police commissioner was... And to me, he was a professional man, and he was a white guy. His mm-hmm. name was Claude Armour. Mm-hmm. And he told us, without any any equivocation, he said, look, we want to take care of Dr. King as long as he's in Memphis. Said, you won't, don't worry about your overtime or nothing. Said, if, you're here, if he's here two days or three days or whatever, say you just keep the tab of the overtime and just make sure that he is protected. Say we don't want anything... If something happened to him, we don't want it to happen here in Memphis. Mm-hmm. Now that was his that was his take on it. Mm-hmm. But shortly after after he retired, when during that time the uh, city uh, uh, council was came into being. Before that time, we had a we had a uh, commission form of government. Okay. Uh, and during the changeover, during the transition, we had a, another man who came to be the police director. His name was. Frank Holloman, mm-hmm. who was a retired FBI man, and and he was a racist. So that's about all I can say, man. Oh, that's cool. But I, I always ask about Frank Holloman. You ever had a chance to talk to Frank Holloman personally? Mm, personally, uh, no, only doing a staff meeting or two or something like that, but not on a personal basis or anything like that. Let me ask you this. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, that was my, the extent of my time Frank. Uh, Holloman was here maybe a year or two before Dr. King passed away, and he and maybe a year after he a year or two after he passed away. Uh, so so I like, heard, okay. I heard that, that several years later he passed away. Uh, he was in a nursing home, a care home, or something before he. His, his, uh, yeah, I heard he was uh-huh. before his final days where he. I understood he would spend his final days in the nursing home or care home somewhere. Okay, I believe he was a FBI agent for like 13 years on the Jago Hooper who, who was yeah. not about the team at all. That's you right. Know, extremist. That's right. Uh, yeah, he was a G-man. I want to ask you this. Where did Dr. King normally stay as far as a hotel? I know there's a controversy 
Did he stay the Lorraine? Was that his hotel that every time he came to Memphis he stayed at, or was that a different hotel? Time, uh, it was uh, more or less, I would I carried him to the Admiral Bimbo Inn uh, uh, Hotel here on the Union in Memphis. And uh, I do recall that there was somewhat of a controversy uh, because they said that he should live in a, in a white, in a black uh, 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 surrounded or something like that. And they, didn't, mm-hmm. they didn't particularly care about him staying there, but but Jesse Jackson were in, was more or less in charge of, of that situation because the man that owned the that was owned the motel, Mr. Bailey. Mm-hmm. He told me that Jesse Jackson wasn't paying any bills and that he didn't leave there paying none of the bills that was uh, uh, accumulated during Dr. King's visit there. Hmm. So I just. I just don't know, man. This, 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 these black people in Memphis were was something else back in that day. And I, you know, um, I was so-called professional blacks who was trying to emulate the white folk, mm-hmm. you know, uh, consciously or subconsciously, and that's just about the way it was. And there's no doubt in my mind that uh, there was one or two blacks that might have been in, involved, uh, indirectly involved. I think I mentioned to you when you first we talked first talked and mentioned this. Uh, mm-hmm. Solomon Jones, the and driver I, that was the driver for uh, yeah, Dr. that's right. Uh, mm-hmm. I had a feeling about him because I knew that uh, he'd been in the for the police department and that uh, uh, they had a lot of texts on the traffic t- traffic tickets, not uh, traffic tickets and some other things they had on, on him before he. During that during that time, he was assigned, and I know that some of the members of the police department took care of him on that. Hmm. That's true. What about what about uh, Billy Cowles? He heard this thing the contrary to what Billy Cowles said. Like he got documentary saying that he spent the last hour of Dr. King's life in room three hundred six. Him, Dr. King, and Rafa Abadassi. I heard him so quick reports that he wasn't in that room for an hour. For how long? So for one hour, he said he spent the last hour yeah, well, of life. Well, that's a good possibility that he was in the room with Dr. King because he and that Reverend Abernathy mm-hmm. and Jesse Jackson were in the room. But uh, because they were coming to meet with, have dinner with Reverend Kyle at his home, my understanding, mm-hmm. to my understanding, and that Solomon Jones were the official driver for Dr. King from, uh, and L- L- R.S. Lewis here on home was always punished a cursed car for Dr. King whenever he came to Memphis. Did Solomon Jones work for R.S. Lewis funeral home? Or? Yes, he did. Uh, he worked for R.S. Lewis funeral home. Whatever happened to him? Is he still alive or he... Nobody? I don't know. I heard that he went on to be a minister, and I just heard that I'm not sure, and I, somebody told me several years ago that I talked to somebody, and they said he still lives, and that he lives in Chicago. Okay. Mm-hmm. What about, uh, are you familiar with, the, I know you're familiar with Larry Payne case. Uh, what do you think about that case, the Larry Payne case? Larry Payne? Yeah, he was the, like the guy, the 16-year-old that got killed in Dr. King's last march from Fowler Holmes. Yeah, I remember that incident. I remember the incident um, because he was at the Fowler Holmes, and that was doing a, a uh, curfew. Mm-hmm. And he was, for whatever, that was, at that time they had... Uh, National Guard and the police riding together in uh, in units. Mm-hmm. And one of the units of these policemen and the National Guards together fired on that man. I understand now. I wasn't there on the scene, but I understand that they, they shot him and killed him. He was shot in the back or something. Like just shot yeah, him he was shot with his hands up in the air. Like he, yeah, he yeah. I talked to his mom and family yeah, yeah. over the break, and I was just like, they mm-hmm. said that the guy who killed him, uh, L.D. Jones, is still alive. I don't know if he's alive or not, but he never he never was charged. Nobody was ever charged uh, with their killing because it was like witnesses all over the place that saw what really happened. Well, they you, the, mom, the mom of the boy, you no, know, they and did. they say the officer's mm-hmm. name was what now? L D Jones. His name was L D Jones. Last name Jones. They say he supposed to be dying on his deathbed, whatever, with uh-huh. nurse care around the clock. I don't know what's true or not. Uh-huh. But I just think it's sad. Cause I think about that case and also the Elton Hayes case. 
uh, both of them are very disturbing to me. And like, no case is not being forgotten about or not being passed on to the next generation uh, to understand how far we came and how far we still got to go. I it was it, to my best of my attention, uh, uh, to my recollection, and checking this thing out myself. Mm-hmm. And you might, this is just confidential. I won't call no names or anything. We're just talking, but there was a, a policeman there. Was name was E. C. Jones. E. C. Jones. Okay. He, he went on to be a city councilman, and uh, later in life, because that time he, I think he had been too long being a policeman. But he went up and and got to be a, a city councilman. And I understand now he was the one, but now I'm not. I, I understand what you're saying. You're not certain that you're saying. No, I'm not certain, but I've heard that down through the years that uh, he was the officer that was responsible for that young man's been murdered like that. Well, I know the FBI was looking at it, and they stopped looking into it. But they told the family that this guy was on his deathbed, so maybe he yeah. he had to be somebody with political connections to be able to get the FBI to stop looking for him like that. I guess. Yeah, well, that's to my knowledge, this man's still alive, so I don't know. He used to be a city councilman. I mean, I'm yeah. a city and like yeah. he had a reputation for being a tough on black people, or being tough. No, on no, 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 no. He he went on to be a, a nice guy, I guess, after that because I knew him. I didn't know him as a policeman, but I heard I, le- I learned him, and as uh, I had some uh, dealings with him as a city councilman down through the years. But uh, later on in life, I understand he was a young policeman that he was the one that responsible for that boy shooting. Oh wow! Uh, I mean, uh, I got the question here. Let me just to talk to him and see where he's at on that. Uh, yeah. And also, like I like to ask you about Morel McCullough. Were you familiar with him at the time? Uh, I heard of him, and yeah, he was a policeman, and he, he uh, I don't know, there were two or three policemen that was, had been assigned. We wasn't assigned. This man, McKellum, I remember him. He was a young policeman. And, and I knew he was an Army Intelligence while I here. He was an Army Intelligence officer, too. Uh, I mean, well, he was he, over uh, Dr. King's body in that picture when they were pointing, he was like the guy kneeling uh, over Dr. King's body on the balcony. Well, see, they didn't let the black officer get participate in none of that thing but it concerned Dr. King. Hmm. Only thing we would do and then we had one or two uh black guys that uh didn't want us to be in charge of Dr. King's security. I remember I had a Jesse Epps was one. You remember her about uh, Jesse Epps? That's that sounds for me, yes sir. He was Jesse Epps was in charge of the uh, sanitation uh uh union. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forgot the name of the union, but Jesse Epps was in charge of the union. And Jesse Epps was very fiery, and he, he uh, I thought he was a man to really do something, but he didn't do anything. As a matter of fact, he tried to hinder us and our security uh, because when Dr. King would come to Memphis, we would get a, a selection of men who, I mean, security people who were, had training in this type of thing. Mm-hmm. And we would go to the uh, to the uh, airport, and we're, I'd have the information because uh, the late uh, Ben Hooks would call us. Ben Hooks was, at that time, he was chairman of the uh, SCLC in Atlanta. And his office would call us and let us know when Dr. King was coming. And uh, so we could prepare security for Dr. King. And uh, Jesse Epps wanted to be in the front line of it. And I would not allow him. I said, look, we're going to have a caravan. You want to be in the caravan? I said, uh, the police uh, is going to is going to lead the caravan. Mm-hmm. And he didn't like that. And so I, I told him, I said, no, we're not going to let you do that. So he didn't like that. That was just one of the incidents that I remember him. And uh, I, I I had somebody to tell me that Jesse Epps was anti-police, anti, uh, I guess, but police. Cause he, he never did uh, He never did show me anything that he was really involved, uh, concerned about Dr. King. Some so people are just trying to, you know, some people just trying to make a headline for themselves, you know. 
Well, like this, like I heard throughout the year, I mean, uh, that Billy Cow's legend was a police informant for the MPD. Is that true? To your knowledge, that's, you that's heard anything about that? That's right. Uh, and this was a good friend of mine. This was, was on the police force. Of sh- he was one of the first black police when Ernest Williams mm-hmm. was. He didn't stay long. He was out three years, then he got back into photography. But Ernest was accused, and I think uh, I saw the document film on uh, mm-hmm. Andrew Andrew Young said that he didn't think that, that there were many black people who were uh, giving information to the FBI uh, for whatever reason, and he didn't trust, he didn't really think that Willis was doing anything other than giving pictures and things. Willis made a lot of pictures for everybody, you know, and. The FBI may have acquired some of his pictures, but I don't believe that. And I knew Ernest, I knew Ernest well. That's like a brother, and I just don't believe that he was involved in. Let me ask you this, then: Do you think he had the mentality of a police officer still? Like he was doing, trying to do a community service? Like he was still thinking like a police officer? Like I know he retired from being a police. No, no, he, he didn't. He wasn't that long. He was there about three years on the force. We started in 1948. Mm-hmm. And this was one of the one of the nine black officers that started. And he was with us when we started. We this nine of us started together. Oh, so you were the original too, sir? Yes, uh huh. Wow, that's amazing. I'm gonna ask you this. I want to know how hard was it? Cause I talked to Mister Withers uh, several years ago. I had the blessing uh-huh. chance to speak to him in his studio on Bill Street. But I want to <laughs> know what was the type of mentality of well, how was it to be a Memphis police officer back then? What could y'all do? What what y'all couldn't do? Well, they didn't well, initially, we were not allowed to arrest white people. Uh, now, okay. we had my ins- the inspector who was in charge of training it was a brilliant man, one of the brilliant, most brilliant white men that I ever met. And hmm. um, he had been a uh, a lieutenant colonel for, in the uh, campaign for, he was when he was in the Army, <coughs> excuse me, for General MacArthur. Oh, wow. Uh, so you was in the Pacific? Huh? He was in the Pacific or something? The Pacific thing? Yeah, in, in the South it? Pacific. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. And uh, this man, Inspector Bill Rainey, was was a lieutenant colonel with him. And of course, when he retired, he came back to the police department as an inspector. Mm. He was a brilliant man. He told us, as young black officers, he said, look, let me tell you something. He said, look, we were just in training, and we were just young recruits. Mm-hmm. He said, I'll tell you, he said, now, you're all going to be, just, you're going to be just as much a policeman as me or any other white person. You're bad, you're going to have a badge, a pistol, and everything else. He said, but I advise you, this would be my advice, he said, because you're not going to be accepted by, totally by your own folk, black people. You're not going to be totally accepted by white people. So I just advise you to just kind of take it easy till, uh, until things get to be normal which will probably take three or four years, and he was right. Uh, we, did, we didn't have any, any uh, problem with white people because at that time, Bill Street was just, just full of blacks. You wouldn't have ten black people that go on Bill Street in a 24-hour period, I mean, for white people. They just didn't come down there unless it was a special show, a midnight, a midnight ramble or something like that, and they would come down there for that. and. Mm-hmm. But uh, basically, Bill Street was for black people. So we didn't really have any trouble with uh, white people down on Bill Street, and we never really had any trouble uh, with uh, white people when we were in some communities that we had to go into. Yeah, so, yeah I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll cut you off. Go ahead, sir. Mm-hmm. So go ahead. Mm-hmm. I want to ask you, you, like, you know, so you saying that you could say a white person commit a crime or kill somebody or rape somebody, you couldn't arrest that person? No, 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 no. The, uh, the, police, uh, the police chief uh, police commissioner at that time, was his name was Boyle, Joseph Boyle. Mm-hmm. And was during that time, there was a ratio uh, uh, of, a ratio of uh, hold-ups, liquor store hold-ups. Mm-hmm. And I asked a question because Commissioner Boyle came to the to the uh, to the uh, meeting that night at headquarters, and I asked him specifically. I said, "Look, do you mean if if a white man come in that store or something, we couldn't kill him?" He said, "Look, anybody, black, white, or blue, say you do what you got to do." 
And hmm. we've taken that for a few that, uh, you know, we, if something goes wrong, we can, we can have it. So it took a while, like I said, maybe two or three years, at, three years at the most. Because when we first started up there at police station, there was just a little uh, bench that, that several officers would sit in because everything was segregated. White people sit in the, in the front and black folks sit in the back. And hmm. uh, we sat right on the side, the side bench, just opposite the court, uh, the court, the the, uh, the court clerk's office, and uh, until our cases were called, and then we could leave. Now we had, <clears throat> we did have privilege to go in the restroom, but black folk, other black folk didn't couldn't go in there uh, at the time. We had there was a there was a restroom there that. That we went into it, and nobody said nothing about that. But I'm going about, back six years ago, man. That's been a long time. Was, uh, it is, but like, but by the fifties, y'all were able to arrest white people and oh, anybody. Yeah, it took a while. I think the one incident that I can always remember is that my partner and I was riding in a squad car, mm-hmm. and we were at uh, E.H. Crump and Walnut. About mm-hmm. three o'clock in the morning, the white guy came through. He was intoxicated. He was uh, driving, and we pulled him over. And he was he could barely get out of the car. And of course, we called the white officers. They came. They carried him to headquarters. <clears throat> and the next morning, I went to court to testify. And to this, this white officer got up to testify as if he actually made the arrest oh, personally wow. himself, you know. Mm-hmm. So the judge didn't like that. He knew such thing was going on, but I guess at this particular time, uh, he said, this enough is enough. I would say that was his, his uh, take on that. He said, uh, officer, this is why officer, did you actually make the physical arrest? Uh, 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 no, no, your honor, uh, uh, Officer Williams make the rest. He said, Officer Williams, you come up, you testify. And that's how we start testifying in court against white people. That took several years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So years that y'all became officers in 48. So they were about 55? Yeah, we came to office in 1949. Oh, 49, so we about, what, 57 or 56? Yeah, yeah, that's okay. right. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you, you remember a case uh, by a brother named Trigger Slim? You remember him? Mm, no. All right, okay, trigger. Okay, what about um? What what were your thoughts and what were your thoughts back then about the invaders, the Memphis invaders, and what are your thoughts now on the invaders? Well, they were just a bunch of young thugs, and they they I don't know who was in Dr. King's group, but they are the ones that started a lot of that mess down there so to get Dr. King. Uh, in that trouble, they, the trouble that we had on Main Street, good time they marching when they when they when they started the route, but they on March they, they, yeah, on March yeah, they, yeah, they, yeah, they started that. They, they, they invaded us because they went over to Carver High School and they invaded their high school. I mean, they had, they turned the school out, hmm. and uh, so one of the white officers came up. There was about a dozen, at least a dozen more white officers in squad cars and all. So I lived in the neighborhood, so I came up there and they said, what's going on? They told me, I said, well, they're trying to turn your school out, so we're not going to be concerned. If they don't want no school, so that's fine, you know, like that. Mm-hmm. So that was the invaders who started that, and they got some money for that. I don't know which one of the guys, it was about nine or ten of them, maybe three or four leaders, at least three leaders, because I know during the time that uh, that happened, that they were had a, uh, uh, a get-together with the uh, young people over at Clayton Temple Church. Mm-hmm. And he wanted to interrupt the meeting. And, uh, the, I mean, these uh, invaders. Mm. And I wouldn't let them interrupt the meeting. So uh, I said, you stay here, and I'll go and talk to one of the people. I believe it was Andy Young, and I made uh, uh, mention to what was going on, and he... Whatever it was, he got it quilled down and everything. Were the black ministers in Memphis receptors to Dr. King and the SCLC coming in uh, to try to help out with the sanitation workers' strike? 
No, uh, not really. Mm. Not really. The uh, Dr. King and those sanitation workers were mostly by themselves and did the thing by themselves. They knew it was wrong. Mm. I remember one time, I never forget, there was a white officer who worked with me in homicide, and we looked out the window at City Hall, and we saw those black men marching around City Hall with the black card saying, I am a man. Mm -hmm. And so one of the white uh, detectives said, and he must have, <laughs> it frightened me with the way he said it. He said, that's a shame that those men got to do that. He said, holding that garbage. And what he was saying was, maggots go down their back when they pick that stuff up. Because back in those days, you didn't have a, a dumpster like they have now. You you had to go to the, you, you uh, now you go to the curb and they got something to put the thing in there so you don't have that kind of situation. But back in those days, they had tin tubs and the uh, garbage would be picked up from the backyard. And most times they didn't have plastic bags and things like we have now. So most times the garbage would just run down the men's back mm. and neck. And, and they didn't they didn't have no kind of uh, 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 protection. Uh, they didn't have no... Uh, Security or uh, uh, anything. I mean, security. I'm trying to the way I'm trying to get. Uh, right, those two workers that fell in the trash can factor while they was eating lunch. So what now? The two uh, sanitation workers who fell in the trash can factor in the garbage truck. Yeah, yeah. While they were eating lunch, it brought Dr. King's attention to what was going on in Memphis. Yeah, one of one of the uh, uh, the uh, dumpsters. That man was crushed in it. You know. As I recall, it was crushed in, the, in that dumpster, uh, in that uh, sort of sanitation dumpster. They had the, the uh, compression, and they pushed the truck, truck back in the truck, and this man, right there, some way or another, he managed to fall in there, and he was crushed to death. Mm. Did, were there any white sanitation workers back then? No, oh. no, 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 no. Why, they, I don't like, see none now. <laughs> I don't might even have, see none now. Might have a white phone or something like that. And I, you know what? I'm gonna tell you, man. I wish these black people ought to realize they got a, they got jobs now. They back then, those days, they didn't have no uh, seniority or nothing. You work on a job 15 years, the white man didn't like it. Hey, nigga, you go on, you you you, you fired, you know. Right. But now these people got seniority. They got everything. And they don't have to. They don't have to work in the rain no more like they used to. They they can come in four hours if it's rainy day or something like that. Mm-hmm. So they got all kinds of con convenience that they didn't have back in those days. And these black folks, some of them don't even want to take your garbage out. <laughs> you know? do, they, do, they, do they have the, the benefits? Like Dr. King came out here to help them get certain benefits. Yeah, they did get benefits, you know. And uh, uh, But what happened, Jesse Epps, okay. was one of the men, I think, now I'm, I'm not, I don't have this in, in writing, but I was told that he was one of the men that uh, he had somebody else that encouraged the sanitation workers to not to take out Social Security. Really? Wow. So as a result, Social Security is not taken out for most of the, it's the uh, sanitation workers even today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I know that's still an issue, but it's like it should have been resolved forty something years ago. Well, yeah, but they 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 uh evidently they signed a, an agreement with the city hall down there, and uh, men like Jesse Epps and things like that signed a contract agreement, and uh, I don't know why, mm -hmm. because they should have known that uh, they would need Social Security. Uh, their pension would would not be felt like when they got the pension that that would have been. Secured enough for them, mm -hmm. but it wasn't. So that was the situation, man. I, I just enjoyed talking with you, and um, I hope I gave you some in insight. Oh yeah, yeah. This uh, yeah. is an honor to talk to you. I mean, you were the first black uh, police officer there. Yeah, I, I wish we had more officers like you. Unfortunately, I see well, around the country, but well, thank you, thank mm -hmm. you. We have another black. And this sure was still alive. Uh, Roscoe mm -hmm. Mike Williams. Okay. You may have heard of him. He's still living as far as I know. And uh and myself. So y'all the last two? Yeah, the last two of the black officers. And what, is he in Memphis? Yeah, he lives in Memphis. I don't remember I know where he lives, uh, What's his name? Huh? 
What's his name again? So what, uh, that, what is his name again? The the, the other uh, officer, uh, uh, Roscoe Roscoe McWilliams. I'll look him up, man. It was an honor. I didn't know you was one of the first, man. I, I talked to you and Mister Williams. So I've been blessed. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate. It. I, yeah, I, I, and I, 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 yeah. Well, I was blessed. I have been blessed. I made it four years old now. Oh, that's a blessing. You don't sound like it, man. He's <laughs> like so you live well, a good life. Thank you, thank you, man. I'm doing pretty good with that. I keep busy. That's what the good Lord let me do. I got, I got real estate that I'm dealing in and working every day. I work eight, eight to ten hours a day. Oh, and, wow. Uh, I got two houses that I'm working on right there. You know what Flake and Haven is on North Second? Yes, sir. Well, I got two houses I'm working on right there next to the Slave Haven house there. And if you ever know that uh, Joan, Joan Nelson, she was a civil rights worker. Okay. And uh, she lives... One of my apartments there. Yeah. So she, she actually was an activist back in the day? Yeah, oh yeah. Her name Joan Nelson. And who she worked with? I mean, who was some of the people that she worked with? Any organization in particular? I wish you would. Uh, if I get her number, I'll let you and ask her. You, you, I'd like for you to interview her. She, oh yeah, it'll be an honor. It'll be an yeah. honor. I'll all this history, man, because we got to learn how to do what y'all did back then. <laughs> in terms of getting some demand, we don't know how to do it right. We got yeah. we got more yeah. technology and resources than y'all, but y'all know how to get it done on a shoe stream. Well, budget. we, we, we <laughs> tried to. We had to because, <laughs> because that was the only way. Black people was, was on our necks. The white people was on our necks, and we had to do what we had to do. But, but you ever think about how crazy it was for us to be subjugated like that, to take all that stuff we took? So what you now? Like, you ever think about how crazy it was? You, know, you look back on it that they hate me and they don't like me because the way I look, something I can't control. You ever well, thought you about know, how crazy it was when you was going through it? Nah, no, but you know what? There, uh, uh, there are people even today. Black people, mm-hmm. even today. You know, I go back to, I uh, think was just talking about 150 years ago after Dr., I mean, after uh, after uh, Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. Mm-hmm. And I go back to how some of the black people were doing back in those days. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just read a, uh, an article on um, Reverend Benjamin Mays from uh, Mo House and how he lived his 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 uh, grandfather, I mean his grandfather, or uh, his father, was in the, in the time of the slavery, uh, a slavery time, mm-hmm. and Mays went on to be one of the most prominent black men in the whole in the whole in the whole United States. Not a kid's mentor, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. So, and I wish young people would understand and realize how these black people, with the struggles that they had, they had no opportunities. But they made opportunities, and they mm-hmm. did well for themselves. I just, I'm a, my, uh, my school, there's Booker T. Washington High School here in Memphis. Are oh, you a uh, Memphian? Yeah, I'm a Memphian. I'm familiar. Y'all got a proud history. I know y'all try to get President Obama to speak there right now. Hopefully, Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's my other part of there. Y'all had a joint graduation uh, with, uh, I don't know if it's Booker T. Washington. I don't get it right now. It was Manassas and Hamilton. They yeah. brought Mary McLeod Bethune here at, uh-huh. at Mason Temple. A lot of people don't even know about that history, but Booker T. Washington, one of my favorite musicians is Johnny Ace. I know he yeah. went there. Yeah, there. I remember Johnny Ace. Yeah, I remember him. Johnny Ace. Uh, he was great, Ooh. man. People forgot about yeah. him. Man. He was like before Elvis. He, he paid the way for so many other yeah. people. Yeah. And Johnny Ace uh, getting involved in a, a Russian rule line of something, killed himself, I believe that was. He, he shot himself in the head, but he didn't know the gun was loaded, though. No, yeah. he didn't know it was loaded, though. But so I heard you know, some stories about that, you know. Yeah, those, I remember I, him. I remember he used to come to the club head down the all the time down what there. What do you, you think know? about him? What do you think about that age? I was, as far as I know, he was a great musician, young man. He great musician, one of the greatest. I wish he had lived. Because he started, I guess, a little before uh, B.B. King did. I mean, I know they was the Bill Streeters, but he became bigger before they did. Because, I mean, they, they said it before... If you want to get John Ace to play at your club or your venue, you had to book B.B. King and Bobby Booper and his opening act. That's right. That's but they got right. out in the Bill Street of him and Roscoe Gordon and, and, and B.B. and Bobby and all of them. Uh-huh. He made it bigger before all of them, but he was like the brother who had the golden voice. Yeah, that's right. I love He him. was. He was quite a guy, a young man, I tell you. Do you think and he was wherever, up? I mean, go ahead. I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, wherever he would would have an affair, sure, it would be a, sell, a sellout, you know. Mm. Uh, he was really good. 